record just to make sure that things are actually working. And now we're fine. Now we're recording. Excellent. So let's get things started. And hello, everyone. Hello, Claudies. Welcome to yet another Cloud Lounge virtual meeting. My name is Alex, and most of you probably already know me. And it's my pleasure to welcome you yet again to our virtual user group meeting today. Now, if you're new to our user group, please know that we call ourselves Cloudies within this community. Cloud D is obviously a made up word. Uh, it's meant to represent a cloud enthusiast or anyway, someone who wants to learn more and share knowledge and experiences or simply just mingle among fellow cloud architects, developers and cloud DevOps and others. Um, our main sponsor is Kitikit Solutions, who covers any of the financial costs related to running events. Kitikit Solutions is an IT company based in Romania, founded and grown by the sole idea of developing cloud based architectures and applications in the cloud. With a 10 year experience in Microsoft Azure, I guess it's easy to say that Critical Solutions is probably among the few cloud centric and especially Azure centric organizations in Romania. Now, as some of you already know, Cloudy Launch is not a net new community, but a local community which was started a decade ago as a community of Azure enthusiasts. And up until recently, our meetings were most of them delivered in person in Aradia, and most of them, even though not all of them, were delivered in Romanian. Every now and then we had some speakers coming over, popping over, especially from Microsoft. And I always had this idea of let's bring in more people, renowned speakers uh, from abroad and have them speak to our local community group. In fact, Carl was, was present in Romania just, just last year and I sh showed him around the Radia. He was very impressed. I, I, at least he told me he was very impressed with the Radia. And we kind of planned this bef way, way before, had, before even realizing that Corona is going to hit us. And we, the, the reality is that today, which actually brings me to the present and the future of Cloud Lounge, in fact, without a doubt, virtual meetings will at some point become the norm. But up, and up until then, we'll run these small, somewhat intimate virtual meetings as a replacement of our in-person events. And there's a high chance that some, uh, at some point when we can safely resume the in-person meetings, we'll probably have in-person meetings again, and we'll also stream them online, and thus also welcoming more Cloudies to, the, to our meetings. And by the way, if you want to become a Cloudy, there's a simple rule. You have to be inclusive and abide to our code of conduct, um, uh, community code of conduct, and that's really it. There's no fees, there's no hidden costs, no gotchas, no anything like that. Yet we do like to stay in touch with people. So if you sign up on our meetup.com account and um, and just, just register with the meetup.com profile, that's it. Now, this also reminds me, by the way, we also have a poll where we are welcoming any additional topics you'd like to see covered in Cloudy Lounge. And I'll share the link during the presentation Carl will deliver for us in a second. Now, Carl, and sorry, apparently I copy pasted here. It's not Glenn. Glenn was here for the previous week. That was my mistake. Sorry about that. I believe Glenn said this of me. <laughs> Glenn said this of you. Carl, uh, who, who we have here with us today, is a good buddy of mine who was eager to help Cloudy's Lounge online presence improve. Um, I've known Carl for a good while now, actually ever since he used to work for Microsoft many years back and later as a fellow community contributor and speaker at various international events, as a fellow uh, Microsoft MVP and even a Microsoft regional director. He's a cloud and cybersecurity expert and the person I always reach out to when I have security concerns with my Azure infrastructures and uh, blueprints. Now, Carl pitched a brilliant title to me recently, which was, as you know, Top Azure Security Fails and How to Avoid Them. As someone who has worked with Azure for the past 10 years, is a topic I can honestly say is not to be ignored. Okay, I guess it's enough mumbo jumbo from my side. So, Carl, take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Alex, for, for those kind of words. And let's see if, if and how we can align with those expectations. Uh, yeah. Hello, everybody from my side as well. I don't have as nice of an animation here on this on this particular slide um, as Alex had on his own. So welcome everybody from my side as well. Uh, let's make this really interactive. So if you have any any questions, uh, feel free to hear in the chat. If I ramble on too much and don't notice, notice those, those questions, uh, then please go ahead and unmute yourself and pick those uh, questions up as well. Today we have a good uh, three quarters of an hour to discuss about one of my favorite topics, uh, top Azure security fails and how to avoid them. Kind of, uh, yeah, best best practices or anti-patterns anti uh, all, all in once um, can fit any, any length or 
type of a session you like. Also as a presenter, very uh, versatile on that side, that sense. I've done this in 15 minutes. I've done this in uh, a full day workshop. So let's see how many slides can we can we go through the day. Again, my name is Carl Lutz. Uh, I'm a cloud and security uh, quote unquote expert. I wear many hats as a community leader from a conference organizer to one of the puppet masters behind Global Azure together with my friend Alex. And beyond this community role, I work as a vice president in the CISO office of a Swiss financial organization, uh, Swiss Re. But today I'm here to, here to speak to you about uh, these topics from the community member hat perspective, not on behalf of my employer. So these stories or anti-patterns or fails that I'm going to talk to you about, these are really kind of experiences that I've seen across my years as a Microsoft, as a consultant and, and different continents, different organizations. And this is, uh, this is really the format of the session. Uh, so I will uh, essentially present one finding at a time in the order of priority. Uh, I will talk about why is this uh, an important matter? Why do I think it is important to call out? All of these are some things I typically see across different teams, team sizes, different industries, different organization sizes. Uh, really, no matter how mature you would expect that team or that um, application environment to be, these are the things that occur time after time after time. But this is no means kind of an extensive uh, based on some sort of open data set or anything. This is just anecdotal uh, things that I want to pick up, uh, pick up here. And let's start with uh, with the fun one, which I really can't believe we still <laughs> still need to talk about, which is really this when you're building public cloud applications, you see you really should not have any of those unprotected public endpoints at all. Here is an example uh, actually from, from a while back ago already of uh, me running a query of uh, in from logs of two virtual machines, two virtual machines only running for 24 hours. Just new Windows virtual machines with the latest updates which I created nicely from the Microsoft gallery. I didn't do anything with them. With them. No, no hardening, no anything. During those 24 hours, uh, I got a quite a bit of logs out of them. And it's just a quick, uh, quick note which I ran ran here. So I ran this query uh, about running those Windows security event IDs, uh, and this event ID matches into this failed login attempt um, Windows event ID. And there were quite a bit of these actually. Uh, you see, I had over 3,000 records available, and this is not just 3,000 failed login attempts. These were actually 3,000 different usernames that have been used in those failed login attempts. So this is really the exposure that you'll get just in 24 hours into your virtual machines if you have anything or any application uh, unprotected in, in the public, public cloud environments. Anyone can, anybody can just download nowadays in a nice Excel format uh, all of the IP address ranges of, of specific Microsoft Azure data in the regions and just start bombarding and start scanning those endpoints. There's a couple of nice ones that I could point out if you're using the uh, settings, you are not actually even able to use this administrator, even this Swedish administrator uh, over here, uh, but you might be able to use uh, a username like Aloha. Um, and we, if we will go further, further in this list, you will see these typical first names, uh, small, smaller first names, Joe, but also some proprietary names like Xerox, Canon, Scanner, and so forth. And because we are in the public cloud, it doesn't really matter if, it, if this is an environment that doesn't touch your existing environment at all. This is this is not really just a problem that you'll fix when you go go production, or this is not something that if it's your dev machine, uh, you can do this. Uh, you really should uh, should start protecting those endpoints all the way from the beginning because you are immediately exposed. 
and this type of an, this type of uh, exposure is very vulnerable to this quite often used password spray type of attacks when uh, which which are not as easily detected or prevented using traditional uh, traditional uh, security controls okay so well how do we fix this well first first bit is easy if if you don't have any public ip addresses that you manage on azure then then you're fine but most likely you you need to because you just can't walk to the machines in the in the microsoft data center and and plug your uh, plug your devices in you need to connect to them somehow so depend you need to understand the cloud responsibility matrix you need to understand which pieces and bits are actually your responsibility which are shared what can you control and so forth for infrastructure as a service uh, you may look at the microsoft network security groups which are the uh, easiest or lowest level access denialist uh, settings sort of like firewalls that you can use to control access in and out in, in ip uh, in in the la layer 4 uh, level you can also use those network security group rules dynamically using something called security center center just in time access that means that by default all of your nsc rules are blocked uh, no no rdp connection is allowed into your environments uh, or any connection and only when you request only when a pre-authorized user requests uh, to get access then uh, for a predefined predefined amount of time at a time for example for just just an hour or for just your for your work day you will get access from your ip address into that uh, network security group into that virtual machine well that makes sense in some cases to do especially in this kind of remote jump box um, when we remote jump box cases maybe cases when maybe a pandemic happens and you need to uh, move move outside of your network peri peri perimeter fast but if you want to open uh, just in time access like that from your on premises network if you still have traditional network perimeter security then you might end up actually opening all of your outbound ip addresses uh, as 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 inbound rules into your network security groups so not really optimal either if possible, I really recommend you to look at Azure Bastion, which is an HTML5 based in browser experience that gives you um, gives you Azure AD authentication and uh, network access into your virtual machines as well. You're using some platform as a service uh, components, quite typically uh, the data services. Uh, we, we are very keen on that because if we build publicly available web applications on Azure, then network level settings are maybe not as 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 meaningful for us uh, depending on what we are doing uh, if we have web web applications on the cloud that we want to expose most likely uh, i recommend you to look at web application firewalls uh, either microsoft own integrated with uh, the Azure front door or even even application gateway or maybe a third party one as well but for platform as a service level um, platform as a service data services uh, you should really look at protecting your access either using uh, private endpoints or those vnet or ip address based firewalls there here's an example of uh, just from the portal from my azure environment i have defined a virtual network that I have opened access to in quote unquote quote firewall. Uh, so inbound rules uh, that are allowed to access. So everybody from this uh, MSFT spoke VNet uh, or specifically that one subnet from there, everybody who's coming from there either through, through a VPN or if I natively have deployed my service there, I'm able to access this uh, storage account. Now, if my storage account keys leak, then it doesn't matter because uh, I have this additional protection here. I can also add IP address based uh, firewall rules here, either within those virtual networks or outside of that scope. And I can even add uh, this, um, quite often I have to add this trusted Microsoft services part, which is really opening access to these shared multi-tenant Microsoft environments. 
Also, private endpoints are additional measure that also prevent you from or protect you from this data exfiltration. Um, quite often, uh, the additional complexity that you add here is there's a learning curve. At the beginning, you need to understand which DNS names that you need to configure on your own. But once it's set up, it's actually pretty straightforward even to uh, define these point-to-point -point private endpoints. And uh, I really recommend you to look at uh, those as well. But be mindful of those DNS, uh, DNS uh, settings and especially services like a storage account that have multiple endpoints uh, require you to work around that a little bit. When we are dealing with publicly available web applications, it's not always possible to protect the whole storage account uh, from public access. public access. We might need to grant public access to or access to users that we don't know where they are yet. And that's where the shared access signature comes in. Um, when we cannot authenticate the users through Azure AD, we should uh, authenticate them using our own business logic and grant them single time use or predefined time use uh, access tokens and not very often people know or use at least uh, the part of SAS tokens. Uh, you can actually add allowed IP address ranges for each individual uh, SAS token that you create. So I really recommend you to look at uh, look at that part as well. All right. Indeed, indeed, Mike, brute force and password spray are our friends uh, on that part of crying wall, I guess. OK, my next piece of rant is really about broken authorization, not not just misconfiguration or anything like that, really, really broke. And a very typical scenario is that I see when I go to any environment in Azure is that almost every Azure user you have there is an owner. Um, and even worse, granted that in the subscription scope. And how how this usually happens when I interview people, then usually that just goes in the way that, yeah, owner was the default role when I, I created this subscription, maybe even before our organization had any subscriptions. And when the new team member came in, they just got the same access that the first one had because that seemed to work. And we, we maybe tried using contributors at, at some point, but then there were some new services that we wanted to use and it wasn't possible. It was a mess, so we didn't really understand it. So everybody's just an owner. Um, that doesn't really cut it. Not an excuse. <laughs> because owner can manage ac user access, can manage any resources in the whole scope of the subscription now and forever. If someone else in the future creates a resource group and creates some business critical applications inside that resource group, you will have owner access for those original owners in the subscription level for those automatically as well. So the access is not just inherited, it is there in perpetuity. And specifically because owner can actually invite also users by default from any authentication provider that your Azure AD tenant allows, then this becomes even more, um, more fearsome. Essentially, owner is a person who can invite anybody in, who can give them any access, including owner. We might not know who they are. We might not know which identity provider they use when we invite them. And once they have that owner, they could uh, they could kick us out and do anything on that environment. They can create costs. They can delete what we've done. Uh, they can change access. They can even delete logs. So scary, right? So what do we do? You really, really, really need to understand role-based access control. And there's lots of different bits and pieces about this. Uh, I really recommend you to look at the scoping, but just for this, uh, this exercise purposes, let's, let's really talk about the roles, the key roles. And let's talk about this owner. Just from the built-in roles perspective, actually owner is actually this uh, let's say supper set of contributor. Contributor is the one who, despite this very modest name, is actually the main administrator role. They are they they are able to create and delete resources. They are able to uh, modify the content. All is well. They are able to scale up, down, make changes, deploy stuff. Pretty pretty big stuff. Owner 
has those same privileges. And on top of that, owner actually has privileges from another built-in role, which is not as widely known, which is user access administrator. Now, user access administrator actually is a role-based access role because its purpose is to just manage access to users, as the name would suggest. Instead of the owner, if you really need to have permissions, maybe for a project manager, for the owner, uh, for if you really need to have permissions to manage user access, then you should use user access administrator. And those who need to actually manage, manage those resources, they should have the contributor role. There really isn't any scenario where you will need to have, have both of them at the same time. <clears throat> when, you con when you consider separation of duties, of course. But that's not it. There's more. Contributor actually acts as a user access admin or contributor actually has power to control access to some Azure data services as well. So if I'm a contributor, I can actually manage who has access to the content of my SQL, Azure SQL. I can make changes to the uh, SQL administrator. I can also open up the firewall if I want to. I can go in and get those magic or master keys, account keys for my storage account. If I leak them, all is lost. Nobody knows who uses those keys anymore after that. And even for Azure Key Vault, which is the security focused data store that we have on Azure on the platform as a service side, even there, until very, very recently, a couple, couple of weeks ago, we did not have a way to prov provide access using role-based access control. We only, only were allowed to use this access policy, which is not under the Microsoft.authorization resource, uh, resource provider namespace, which means that a contributor, as it has access to write any access to any resource providers except write access to the Microsoft authorization, then the contributor was actually able to make those uh, access policy changes to a key vault as well, to change who has access to our most secret data. That's bad. So beware of the contributor as well. Another part which I mentioned is, is the scope. I won't delve into this too deep. Really, you should minimize these highest level subscription level assignments. You should prefer these resource group assignments. And instead of thinking of a custom role, which I quite often see people kind of over engineer, instead of thinking of this custom role, I really recommend you to look at scoping using this one of these built in roles instead. Instead of building a custom network or subnet joiner type of a contributor or a custom role-based access control role, you should look at maybe granting contributor access in the sub-resource le level of that virtual network. And subnet, or subnet is, of course, the sub-resource, uh, which has its own role-based access control assignment uh, possibility as well. It's not as standard, so it's not as often thought, but perfectly possible without messing with those pesky, uh, pesky custom roles. Oh, now we are getting somewhere. Missing audit logging. And, and I really, really, th really mean missing. I don't, I don't mean insufficient audit logging, like you see in some unnamed um, top security vulnerability lists. I really mean missing audit logging because most Azure services don't actually by default emit or store any of their audit logs because of a lot of complicated pricing and comparison and competition and marketing reasons microsoft does not take the responsibility it's always fully your responsibility to store which logs and for how long and where do you want to store them and this is even true with these security focused services even for Azure Key Vault, which by default, by definition, is a service that is that is supposed to be used for securely managing access 
to our most darkest and most precious secrets. Managing access should include actually making, making a list, creating a log of who has accessed it. That's part of the managing of the access. But no, Key Vault does not create audit logs by default. Not even web application firewall by default stores any logs. You need to turn those on. How do you do them? It's easy. You just go to this place called audit, oh sorry, diagnostic settings, not audit logs. So it's a little bit hidden. You need to know that it is under this umbrella of Azure monitoring. It's not under any security umbrella. And under each specific service, in this example, Azure Key Vault, you go to diagnostic setting and you create a new diagnostic setting per each of your log retention scenario. And for each of those scenario, because remember you can have multiple diagnostic settings or metric uh, log emitters uh, per, per each service. Uh, for each of those, you define what are the data sources that you want to store or emit and where do you want to store them. And if it's a log analytics workspace, there's a retention configuration on that end. If it's a storage account, uh, then you might need to go ahead and configure that storage account into warm or write once read many type of uh, type of storage you need to configure some retention time there on your own um, or if you are uh, emitting those logs into an outside SOC or a service provider or just in your other tenant you might have multiple tenants on your own then you then you can also use azure event hub for that purpose so that target is always a, a part of your diagnostic settings each service has their own. Azure Key Vault has audit event that we are interested in. Azure Firewall, uh, Web Application Firewall um, has, uh, has their own firewall log events uh, and so forth and so forth. And maybe at some point someone actually needs to look at those logs as well. Well, luckily we have a computer to do that for us a little bit. Well, this service, uh, formerly known as Azure, uh, I, I'm sure my, my, my friends here in the chat can pull in all of the different old names, but the latest uh, names that I remember for this are Azure uh, Threat Protection and Azure uh, Advanced Security for Azure Storage. I believe what, there was one of these names. Anyway, since Ignite, Everything was branded under Defender, so bits and pieces of the Security Center paid tier uh, alerts uh, that were available for us formerly, previously under the name of Advanced Threat Protection, they are now called Azure Defender. So there's Azure Defender for storage, there's Azure Defender for app service, and so forth. So a lot of names. I just call them Azure Defender. Here's an example of these automatic, automatic alerts that I will get from each of my Azure Defender uh, service. Um, actively, if I go into my, uh, for example, into my storage account, I get stuff like there's a unusual access pattern into my, into my data. Typically, this identity uses different, maybe only just stores logs. Now they downloaded everything. There's something unusual happening here. They do some statistical analysis or machine learning there to alert those, and it will it evolves over time as well. You turn this on in the Azure Resource Manager level, not in the service, in this service specifically, so not in Azure Storage, uh, but you actually link that Azure Storage. Um, you actually create a resource resource in the Azure Security Center which takes in this Azure Storage ID actually as a parameter. Here's another example of how that actually looks like. Here's an Azure Defender alert about unusual activity in a storage account. Um, what was unusual about this case is the location. Uh, this is from Kuusankoski, Finland. Uh, Finland is in, in the middle of nowhere, and Kuusankoski is from Finnish perspective in the middle of nowhere, so this was you know, pretty suspicious by default. Uh, what happened here in this case that is that uh, the developer just didn't tell anyone that he was working uh, remotely from their summer cottage 
and we, we found found this out that way. So they give you some action items, they give you some potential causes, they give you if this might be something that's, uh, that, that's whether or not this might be also a false positive or something that you need to mitigate as well. So we have a lot of these built-in alerts in the Azure Defender there, uh, but we can also create our own alerts that I really recommend you to do for some really high touch events like somebody lost listing the storage account keys somebody listing the kubernetes cluster credentials and so forth uh, if i define my activity log alert which at least luckily activity logs are the, the type of log that actually get automatically emitted they are stored even automatically for for 90 days uh, but you should also go into into that and create those alerts because there's also a bit of noise in there as well so anywho so uh, once you create your alerts out of those activity log events, um, you can also com you can also check them in your uh, favorite endpoint. For me, I don't I don't want to have any any Teams or uh, let's say email messages or alerts, but I do have the iPhone app for my Azure Azure service, so of course I want to get subscribed to those push notifications there. And then finally, uh, another place to look at your alerting is the Azure Application Insight. Um, there are even cases where a specific application uh, actually is under uh, a denial of service type of attack and none of your typical measures actually detect it, except your performance alerts in your Azure Application Insight that give you this comparison, statistical analysis of how is this, um, this piece of performance indicator how has this changed uh, in or how is this how does this compare to your usual scenario a thousand percent slower seems like something that i should care about all right exactly working from vegas cool okay let's continue uh, with, with this list. Um, storage, uh, storage account access keys used directly. And this is just a very specific example of this overall secret management, um, which you should consider for any type of secrets. But very, very often I see uh, just those uh, traditional legacy authentication systems for Azure data type of services be it Azure Container Registry, Storage Account, these others really used directly, at, at least in my environment in the developer machine. And they are not used by used uh, in, in any way securely. They are not stored in a secure location. They are not fetched uh, at runtime. They're just stored maybe even at worst case, of course, hard coded into the actual application code. So all of those legacy authentication keys including storage account access keys stored in your Azure Key Vault. They should be rotated automatically if you really, really need to use these, uh, these type of authentication methods. Preferably not. We do have data pain role based access control roles nowadays available. I, as a developer, can actually authenticate from my Visual Studio environment natively using my own credentials. I can even use uh, some other uh, NPU type of user, which if, if I am, a, let's say, a functional tester that needs to verify that did this data actually get written into this storage account or not. So best way centrally to approach this is just to lock everybody out of this micro.storage list keys action using role-based access control and see what happens, who comes complaining. Or and uh, start using those data pane role-based access control roles for user access, but also for service access uh, to your environment as well. Good. Last topic before giving out some resources. Uh, this is really a twofold topic that I want to discuss in, in this one common denominator here. And it's really about who do you trust from your authentication perspective? Um, 
quite often I see that there is virtually no management of which authentication providers are able to be linked into our Azure AD tenant. Or even worse, not even using Azure AD based authentication in my applications at all, but using, let's say, a self hosted identity uh, logic or maybe some shadow IT tool or maybe just using a username and password list somewhere. Uh, hopefully even at the server side, not just on the client in JSON, as one of my Twitter friends pointed out in one particularly crazy application very recently. So by default, Azure Active Directory can be linked to any other Azure Active Directory and it is free, so anybody can create one. So we really need to create some sort of management or onboarding process for those trusted Azure ADs. But even further, by default, you can even use some consumer authentications or authentication providers as well. You can use Google, you can use Microsoft personal accounts, you can use uh, even one-time password, which is just, hey, I have access to this email inbox, send me a new one one OTP every 24 hours. So you don't even need to have an authentication, you just need to have proof that I bought this, busted someone's email. And as, as I mentioned earlier, when you actually invite someone in, at that point, if it's the first time you are assigning somebody a role-based access control assignment, that also actually invites that as a B2B guest into your Azure AD tenant. That's fine, but at that time you don't know which identity provider they will be using. I personally can have the same domain uh, domain name listed into my Azure AD, my personal Microsoft account, my Gmail, my whatever, you name it. So you should keep those onboarding of the user separate from that actual access assignment. You should really always use the trusted Azure AD authentication and preferably use Azure AD privilege identity management, even if you're not using that for managing the access. At least you should use PIM to actually monitor, create logs and automatically again alert from those high privilege access uh, changes. If I have PIM turned on but not configured any assignments, it will actually just assign a service principal into my subscription level and it will listen in to any Microsoft authorization changes and it will raise me alerts if there are some owner role changes and so forth. There might be very good reasons for you to limit your guest invitation policies by default if you am a user or even a guest user in uh, in the Azure AD, then I can just invite anyone again from any authentication provider. So we, we really don't want that. Your Azure AD tenant level, uh, on that level, you can um, you can change these members can invite, guests in, guests can invite uh, into no. If you do that, you can still let an individual developer team be reasonably agile. You can assign them Azure AD roles, not Azure role-based access control roles, but Azure AD roles uh, that are appropriate for inviting guests. There are different variations available. And here's the last, last part of the collab collaboration restrictions. Uh, you can say, set a allow list of onboarded known good uh, tenants or domains for collaboration. In that case, you can still keep members inviting, but they are just not able to invite in users from uh, from unknown unknown tenants or environments. All right. So when I'm using a trusted authentication provider, Azure AD, natively also for my applications, not just for my developers, I can actually benefit a, a good deal. I can build a service here. Here's an example of this fictitious company, Kinetico, who is building uh, sustainable energy components. They have this. Uh, uh, they have they have this um, self um, end consumer installable um, devices. You can you can maybe use 
a sun, ele sun electricity conversion, you can maybe use a windmill, doesn't really matter. Uh, here, as, here as a user on the left, I've installed it on my home. Um, I access the, com I get, I get redirected to my authentication provider. I get to log in. They get to get to see uh, again service to service uh, authentication done and access control done using managed identities in this case. So no credentials are passed. We get to uh, reference which particular device am I in installing there, um, and we can even grant access to those installation manuals. Uh, using using the same logic into our eventually in our web application. How that looks from the management perspective is that everything is logged. I, I get to see the sign ins to the application, both successful and unsuccessful ones. I get to see the reasons uh, why they were unsuccessful. I get to see the conditional access statuses. I get to see which device they used. Uh, there's lots of risk uh, information that is added for me in there, and I get to set a lot of configurations. I can even set network for image level defenses. I can se select that you only can access this particular application from a known good network and so forth. Good. I am at the minute. Very good. I have a couple of calls to action. And actually, the first call to action is, is from Alex. Uh, please vote for new topics or recurring topics uh, in the, in the, from, the, from the link that was just posted. Great to see what is actually the interest here. Hope to return if there's more deeper uh, or specific uh, sessions wanted around Azure Security. My one good call to action here for anybody from centralized or enterprise perspective, from an IT admin perspective, from a security analyst perspective, from a developer perspective, is to go ahead and check out Secure DevOps Kit for Azure, which is uh, this uh, Microsoft IT built toolkit, PowerShell based toolkit uh, for scanning uh, your Azure environments using your own credentials. Uh, reader is, is, is enough for a lot of cases. And you will essentially get a quite an extensive uh, set of tests that you can run against your environment. You get configurations, uh, statuses, uh, and you get uh, recommendations which are high, medium, low priorities. And you get this nice um, traffic light type of, uh, type of overview that how well are you doing against well, Microsoft's own recommendations, how Microsoft secures their own applications uh, in the cloud. They might not be one-to-one -one relevant to you. A lot of those uh, could still be very valid um, uh, findings regardless of, of the particular uh, result there. So I really recommend you look at, look at this. It's really non-intrusive for you. And the second bit is the Azure Security Benchmark. And the Azure Security Benchmark is um, fairly new. Uh, in version a year ago, it uh, it was a subset or a link to this Cloud Adaption Framework, uh, security controls related to that. It was just just renewed, and Microsoft added a ton of new security controls. They have uh, guidance on for each specific Azure service. Uh, you have some security controls that are um, the configurations, uh, known good configurations that are uh, defined, and they are also mapped into known common uh, policies. We have CIS, we have NIST, uh, we have uh, other industry specific ones such as PCI DSS and so forth. I really recommend you look at this Azure Security Benchmark because it is integrated with, uh, with your Azure policies and by that your Azure Security Center as well. So it's not just a piece of documentation that you need to copy paste some Excel sheets all over, but specifically it's a tool that helps you scale your Azure security policies. Is that? No. Awesome. Uh, one last call to action. Uh, check out my LinkedIn learning courses. 
there's one on security, one on containers, one coming out on Azure Application Gateway in in a month or so. Uh, if you're not subscribing to LinkedIn Learning, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Refer, uh, just refer to this session, uh, send me an email, and I will send you a, a free trial to this uh, this particular video that you video course that you can consume uh, consume fully. Cool. Giveaways indeed. That was my last final final slide. Uh, I see a lot of enthusiasm for AZSK. I really, uh, really lo love that enthusiasm, and I'm not surprised by whom whom they are. Uh, I don't by qu a quick scan. I don't see a lot of a uh, lot of questions or anything that I'm missing here. Uh, now is now is really your time. I will be here until your questions run out or I run out of my tea. I guess. And yeah, thank you for listening in. <laughs> How do you tackle security in CI CD? Uh, do we, so some orgs even look at this by having a separate sec, DevSecOps, SecDevOps, depends on how you look at it, team. Is it a separate responsibility? Um, oh yeah, I'm not telling anyone. Apparently, uh, Mike is the one that gives a full session, so no spoilers uh, on that side. Um, from my perspective, security has been too long. This kind of ivory tower, uh, or maybe this uh, mystified beast. Uh, I really want to quote unquote to, to to use some jargon speak here to shift left on the security. So security should really be everybody's responsibility, the developers on their own, all the, all the way when they start exploring on this new service, they should know what, what are the actual options. They should be aware of the best practices and guidelines, not something that security is some sort of a, a gate in your uh, CI CD pipeline that you need to run this tool. And if that's green, no matter how you do it, then you're good. Um, it should be really something that uh, I believe should be in your face for everybody working on the Azure environments, not just the implementers, but also the project managers and everybody. Um, so I, I think at a certain scale, of course, it makes sense to have some sort of uh, specialist teams uh, for those as well. Uh, but I don't want that to be kind of the excuse of the developers themselves or the PMs, the POs themselves to worry about security. And thank you for that answer. Thanks for having me. Of course. Thank you for a great session. Let's wait for a few more seconds during an awkward silence, I guess. Because people might still have some, some questions. I see that some people were typing previously, but I haven't seen their, their questions yet. Out of curiosity, which one was the? I know I know your title is called Top, but which one was like the most popular vulnerability or attack surface area that you typically see in Azure infrastructures? And FYI, you're on mute. Yeah, uh, you mean the one <laughs> that I, I really see the most. Yeah, uh, there's a difference between the volume versus the irritation <laughs> to me personally. Um, I guess because of the sheer volume of these traditional uh, hosting methods or new takes at traditional hosting methods, methods uh, I'm think, talking about infrastructure as a service or containers as a service, uh, whenever we are dealing with uh, not just our own application in a very tight sandbox, but when, it, when we are actually responsible for quite a bit of this underlying service underneath, whether it is a virtual machine that needs to be patched or whether it is a container security issue. Those are really the most noisy or voluminous ones that, that I see, honestly. Um, especially if you have, if you're standardizing using, let's say, Azure Container Registry, you can actually quite easily integrate that with container scanning tools. Uh, 
just turn it on for the fun of it, just like uh, just like run the HDSK and see when were your base images later, uh, kind of data latest uh, updated and so forth. Mike, Mike is telling us, yes, it's also in Azure Security Center. Yes, I believe that is now an Azure Defender for Azure Container Registry. Uh, Crazy could, name. <laughs> could very well be. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, and uh, yeah, some people uh, apparently could even use some uh, some non-Azure Microsoft uh, <laughs> services there as well. Um, so that is one of the most voluminous one, but that's not the most irritating one to me because it's it's pretty much kind of you somehow somehow made the decision to go into this this particular uh, management mode. So you should pretty much someone should have known what they're doing, um, and there are approaches uh, there that are not specific to my Microsoft scene or Azure scene. But may, maybe the most personally irritating ones to me are really about this role-based access control, how it actually affects all the way to the data level, um, and how is the coupling of your specific Azure service done with Azure AD. So for example, understanding that Azure AD actually is protecting your key vault, even if you don't have a firewall on your key vault, there is still this tenant level uh, kind of authentication parameter that you, will, uh, you can add. And because you have everything in a trusted identity, perimeter, you can actually have conditional access loggings that certain things need to happen. You Maybe all of your users need to always come from managed devices or from known networks. So having this Azure AD's uh, ubiquitousness, <laughs> oh my God, I lost my words now. Um, yes, uh, understanding that uh, Azure AD is really ubiquitous, it's really out there, always there with you, whether you're dealing with role-based access control, whether you're dealing with thinking uh, the network isolation versus having any level of network control, whether, whether you're thinking of logs, they not, might not be coming from your service, they might, the resource you're protecting or your application, they might be stored in this centralized uh, place uh, on your whole tenant level. Fair enough. Yeah, I think that's a good answer. Now, for anyone who was who is watching, who's still watching, um, I know you've already shared a couple of call to actions, but what is like the number one thing that you would do if you were us? As in, like right now, download the uh, AZSK and and give it a run. Do they need any special permissions or privileges for that? Or what what you, what would you do? Like number one. Yeah, I think. Uh... Even if you don't want to kind of add to your next next sprint some sort of uh, let's start blaming people, you can just on your own without kind of actually anyone knowing almost, uh, you can just install the AZSK on your cloud shell or on your development environment and just using your existing privileges, you really only need reader privileges to get some information. Uh, if you're also a member of that AD tenant, you get a little bit more information of the access control and all of that, uh, but you already get quite a bit of information when you just run, just using reader credentials uh, in the scope that you want, whether it is resource group, subscription. Um, if you need to do it for multiple subscriptions, then most likely you already know that something's wrong and you need to build something something a little bit more scalable. There are some solutions on, on that side as well. Uh, what I will say that if you want to run that centrally, then it could take a little bit of time. Uh, you, you multiply however uh, 10, 15 seconds it takes to query a result using Azure PowerShell, not Azure Graph, but Azure PowerShell uh, for each of your service that you're scanning, for each of your subscriptions that you're in. So it is to run your whole uh, whole environment. So it's Fair not enough. real real time, or it's 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 not not like an alerting mechanism, or it's it's fully different from this policy uh, based implementation that ASB or Security Center are using. And I appreciate Mike for also adding that MFA multi-factor authentication is probably one of the first thing that you should implement. Uh, I agree with that as well. I liked how you touched on without <sighs> anyone knowing, um, like. In my opinion, if you are able to run AZSK and get valid results out of it, and they still don't have other, don't yet know that you're an AZSK or they have a problem. Um, yes. You, you uh, might be a white hat, but 
like in a, a good citizen trying to show here are our, our vulnerabilities, but you might as well be a black hat. And if you run that thing and nobody knows, well, you're, you're in some trouble. Exactly. And what I do want to say about MFA is, yes, uh, that is something that all cloud application users, it's not just Azure kind of apps or Azure infra specific, uh, but maybe it is worth to reiterate also for the recording that, yes, even Microsoft is saying that even for Microsoft partners, uh, the, I don't know what's the number of the day, was it 99% of any of credential theft or credential abuse attacks would have been prevented using MFA. So do, just like for any other parts of life, you know, do you want to be part of, do you want to be part of the 1% or do you want to be part of the 99%? Yeah, fair I think question. That's a question for you. And and because no one else is asking, typing, or unmuting themselves, last question for you. You probably get this a lot. Which one is safer, AWS or Azure? <laughs> I mean, uh, I had a session a couple of years back at at uh, Igloo where I showed the picture of a perfect, uh, perfectly secure computer, and it's uh, it's a beat computer. It's the Abacus which is literally not connected to anything. It doesn't have any input. And I think that's the, that is still the only secure computer or computing environment that I've, I've seen. Uh, whatever you actually want to achieve uh, on top of that, uh, then anything that you achieve, uh, if you add complexity on top of uh, a beat computer, you're always thinking, taking risks and you should know what you're doing for both of those both of those clouds uh, to me all of these things that we've discussed about the uh, Microsoft identity perimeter or this Azure AD being there for all Azure services uh, even for the data access level application access level everything centrally that integration there to me is is such a great benefit that you can you can have that even if you have authentication sync type of approaches in those other uh, clouds, it's really something unique to Microsoft because they are really on those both bases. They are on those software as a service uh, identity games, SSO game, and they're also in this uh, infra and uh, application platform game. Totally. Yeah, very much so. I see Ishvan is typing a question right now, so I'm going to wait for the question. <coughs> this was a good session, man. Thank you. Thanks. I, I love especially the la this last part here, just chatting. I think that's the best part of user groups. Yes, that's right. And, and this is a good way to mimic, mimic that here, here as well. Granted, we don't have pizza to share, uh, unless a virtual one, probably. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I have gummy bears. Which oh, Haribo. Are... <laughs> so these are, these are my swag, so come on over. <laughs> what was the jingle in German? Haribo, my kinder flow, and the Eltern neben so. Oh, so All here right. it is. Oh, that's a good one. Ooh, that's a very nice. good question. So lateral movement, um, I guess this is from, and feel free to uh, kind of add context, but I guess this is from getting exposed on the cloud and maybe from this, especially because misconfiguration user error is one of those top, uh, not just by me, but just statistically. Also, if you look at Verizon data breaches and all of those, uh, when you get in from the cloud, how do you get back into into on-prem and and both directions? Yeah, that's maybe again a good place to use these uh, AD or Azure AD based tools. Uh, I'm sure Mike Mike knows the latest branding names for those as well. I don't even dare to uh, dare to think what did they do to the names uh, during Ignite for uh, for Windows ATP. Uh, <laughs> Feel free to unmute whatever the name is is nowadays. I I don't know if it's is is it really Defender? No, Service Defender is that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is fun. No. Uh, yes. Yeah, so Microsoft Defender ADX apparently is uh, is now the tool that actually you install that uh, mirrors incoming or both side mirrors uh, network traffic to your DC uh, and. And actually, uh, actually, just uh, 
it emits all of those logs from 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 your Azure AD DS side, and you can get that information combined together with your Azure AD cloud, whatever is the new name for CAS, Cloud App Security, uh, I guess Cloud Defender, um, Office 365, uh, Microsoft 365 Defender, maybe. Uh, so you get both uh, in both of those places you get the signal from your on-prem AD and you get the signal from your Azure AD and all of the connected applications there. You get the risk profiles from each of those logins and you get this nice uh, Mitre attack uh, type of stages and profiles based on that. And when you actually find a specific, uh, specific um, login or specific scenario that you're interested in, uh, it automatically Let's you query, let's you query those um, into, into appropriate timelines uh, there there as well. It used to be called uh, from on the, the cloud side used to be called CAS Cloud App Security. Uh, on, that combined those for your SSOs and Azure AD logins and uh, whatever you did on your Azure AD side. But that piece of cloud UI was the one that um, that can also take input from the Microsoft Defender Windows ATP that you will then install on your on-prem side. Excellent, excellent question. And that's, I believe, in a lot of the Sentinel use cases, uh, that is, if you look at the public use cases, uh, that type of hybrid scenario is very much present. Uh, I recall a couple of years ago asking a list of references for Windows ATP. Uh, but because that's actually al already a threat vector, if you know that th this environment is already protected using uh, Windows ATP, then that there's not quite, a, not almost any information avail available of those uses. <laughs> Conveniently, Mike has to rush away now. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're gonna wrap it here. And thanks awesome. everyone for joining. And, uh, and thank you, Carl, for the fantastic presentation. I'm going to take the screen sharing now for the outro slide, so to say. Um, the next session we'll have with, under the Cloudy Lounge umbrella is going to be at some point at the beginning of November, so next month, less than a month away probably. We are going to announce the next speaker and the next topic of the um, presentation that is coming up somewhere around probably within a week or a couple of weeks under the meetup.com discussion group in our meetup.com uh, page. And with that, thank you one more time, Carl, and thank you everyone for joining in for the fantastic questions. I guess I'll hear you or see you whenever, whenever is possible. And until then, stay safe, everyone. Awesome. Thank you.